Shalom Aleichem, tonight is the Your Tzayt of the Zerah Shimshon. We're running a little late today, unfortunately, but I'm telling you this week, I just, I just told them, I want to tell the people on the camera, I, I was trying to record this, this lecture all week, but it's, things came up. It's already Thursday, I usually record it by Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. Couldn't do it this week. Whatever reason, Hashem wanted us to do it tonight. Tonight is the 6th of Elul. 6th of Elul is the Your Tzayt of Rabbi Shimshon Nachmani. Chaim Nachmani, Alaba Shalom. And um, it's an extra sigula to learn his Torah on his Yor Tzayt even more so than the rest of the year. So, so Bezat Hashem, all the promises that he put in his introduction should fall upon us and all of Israel. And Zekutoy Aganilu, Amen, Ken Yihadson. We're going to learn Parashat Shofatim. This is going to, the last drush he has, I believe it's drush Zayin. It's the drush that he has on the Haftarah. So usually I like to do the ones on the Torah, but he has some Chidushim on the Haftarah. It says over here, Midrash al Kuti brings you a Midrash from Al-Kut Shimoni. Says the following: Amar Rabbi Abba, Bar Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Abba, son of Rabbi Shimon, said, Bar Rabbi Shimon Lakish, the son of Rabbi Shimon Lakish. He said, Mashal lemelech shekaas al matrona. You can learn the following parable. If you had a king who got very angry at his wife or one of his mistresses, right? His queen. Betarda b'hotziah mitoch pelatin shilo, and he kicked her out of his palace. He got very upset with her, kicked her out of his palace. After some time passed, right, everybody calms down, everybody thinks about what they did. He wanted her back. Couldn't live without her. He wanted her back. Amra, she came back, she said, If you want me back, double my ketubah. What's ketubah? Ketubah is a document that when they get married, then in the case of divorce or if the husband dies and she becomes widowed, the woman is entitled to certain monetary benefits so she, so, so she is uh, you know, financially protected. So here, she says, you want me back? Whatever amount you put in the ketubah first, double it. Then you could take me back. This is the mashal. What's the nimshal? What are we compared to? This is what Hashem said to the Jews at Mount Sinai. Amarti lachem pa'am hat. He says at Mount Sinai, when God gave the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the opening word of the Ten Commandments was what word? Anochi. Aleph nun chaf yud. Anochi. A very formal way of saying I. Anochi Hashem lekecha. Right? The first commandment is I am Hashem your God. So the whole Ten Commandments is, is understood as being like fathered by that word Anochi, because everything is, is hinted in there. Yerushalayim le'atil lavo. But in the future in Yerushalayim. I will tell you, God says to, to Bnei Israel, I'm going to tell you Anochi twice. I'm going to double the Anochi. What Pasuk is that referring to? That's referring to the very first Pasuk in the Haftarah. This week's uh, Haftarah. Which starts with the words, I, I, God is speaking, right, to the prophet of uh, Prophet Isaiah. That's the Haftarah. I, I am the one who's going to console you. Why consoling? We're right now in the middle of something called seven... Haftarot of consolation, right after after uh, after Tisha B'Av, seven weeks in a row we have haftarot that have to do with God consoling us. Don't worry, I'm with you. I love you. We're going to be back together. And this is one of them. These seven are very strong. There's, there's, there's a lachot about which haftarot you say every week, depending on what comes out, what doesn't come out. Or, right? For example, last Shabbat was what Rosh Chodesh Elul. Usually on Rosh Chodesh, the one falls on Shabbat, there's a special haftarah about Rosh Chodesh to be read. But that one was not read last week. Rather, we read the one. That, that's the one of the seven consolations because it's that powerful. It's, it's unbreakable. So same thing over here. God says, I gave you Anuchi at Mount Sinai. In the future, when I console you after in times of Mashiach, it's going to be double Anuchi. Double I. So now, this is an interesting midrash, but there's some serious questions on this. Kashe. This is problematic. What's the big deal? What exactly is the benefit that we're getting from two Anuchis? Okay, Anuchi means I. We had one I at Mount Sinai. Two later in Yerushalayim. What do we benefit from two eyes? What's the, what does that mean practically? What's the point of doubling them? What's the idea? <coughs> this is first, you can, you can figure it out from the following. We have a concept in Alakha about women. Let's say a guy, Chas Shalom, violated a girl he came upon her she was a virgin girl now she's not a virgin nobody wants her the halakha is if the guy is caught and his witnesses and everything he is taken to Beidin and Beidin the Torah says he has to pay the father 
of the of the girl, an amount of money called fifty sela. Sela is like a weight, like a silver coin. Fifty sela he has to pay. So if you do conversions, the different, there's different monetary you know monies that we speak about in Torah. A conversion of sela to zuzim, zuz is like the golden coin. There's going to be two hundred my time zuz, two hundred zuz. So he has to pay two hundred zuz for violating the girl. Not only that, he has to marry her, and he's not never allowed to divorce her. That's a mitzvah straight in the Torah. That's where that's, where, that's what it says. That's one situation. You have another situation called the hamotzi shemra, motzi shemra, someone who who creates a bad name about a girl. That situation is if the guy got married to a girl normally, whatever they went to the whole wedding, and the day after the wedding. After you know, after the night of their uh, first time together, he says she's no good. She's not a virgin. I thought she was a virgin, but she's not a virgin. I don't see any blood. That's the claim he makes. But really, she did have blood. So he's lying. So the Torah speaks about over there. What happens that uh, the, the, the father of the of the bride, if he's able to get the bed sheets, which have the proof of the blood on them, and he shows them, he produces them in bedim. There is a machlok in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gemara whether or not he actually act, he has to actually bring bread, bed sheets or whether he has to bring witnesses. Whole thing. Bottom line, he proves it. He proves that she was a, a virgin. In this case, also, he has to keep her. The husband has to keep her, and he's never allowed to divorce her as a penalty. You try to defame her name. Now you prove that you were wrong. She's yours forever now, right? Now again, this is uh, as long as the woman is, is wants it as well. Not only does he have to keep her forever in the Motzi Shemra case where he was proved that she was actually a virgin, also he has to pay a penalty. What's the penalty he has to pay? 100 Sela. So that's half. No, 100 Sela is going to be 400 Zuz. So the point is it's 50 in, in the previous case and 100 in this case. It's a double. And then, therefore, same thing over here, you can apply the, the concept to God and Bnei Israel. He says the whole idea of the, of the, the, the 200 and the 100, you apply here as well. Because what happened was, the Motsi Shemra case, here, it explains here. If so, when the king kicked out his queen, Kicked her out of his palace. What did he do by doing that? He did something called Motsi Shemra. He put out a bad name about her. He said, She did this. She, she cheated on me. Whatever the case was. She's, you know, slept around. Whatever the case was, that was his claim up upon her. And now that he wants to get her back, what does that mean? He must have done an investigation and figured out that he was wrong. And that he really wants her back, just like the Moshe Shamra case with the blood and everything. <laughs> that the truth was that she really didn't, uh, she didn't cheat on him. And that's why he wants to get her back. That's why she says, You want me back after you defamed my name, embarrassed me? Give me double my kituba. Just like the Moshe Shamra case, he has to pay double. Whatever the first case was. The first case was the violation case. Moshe Shemra case, he has to pay double. Right? Over there was 50 sela, here's 100 sela. Lefisha kevan she gira shea mi beto hayu hakol omrim shehi zinta vezehu din umishpad shela kefel ki hotsi shemra al betulat israel, betulat israel mamash. Right? Basically what we explained. Vezeh atam shehacha shehi galenu adosh b'chum. And this is the same reason, right? This is all compared to that, uh, that, that midrash compared the case of the king and the queen to uh, the case of God and the Jews, right? We're like God's wife, so to speak. And when God threw us in Galut, that was like the, when uh, the king kicks the queen out. He throws, I don't want you guys, for, at least for now, temporarily. You guys sinned, you're terrible. But then at the end, he's going to do a double anochi. What does it mean? He's going to want us back. And he's going to have to pay us double the goodness that he paid us at Mount Sinai. There was only one anochi at Mount Sinai. But in the future, when he takes us back, he's going to give us double the, double the good. And not only that, just like in the case of Moshe Shemra, when he takes her back, he's never allowed to divorce her. Same thing. She will be his wife forever. God, we're going to be God's wife forever in the future, so to speak. After that, no more galut. No more exiles. That's going to be the final straw. And God's going to keep us forever. Good. That's his first step. The next step, he goes a little deeper. This is a long piece. I'm just going to give you the highlights, not the whole thing. Look what he says now. Nevertheless, we have to do some more digging, he says here. 
בעניין פרטיות השבח של אנוכי. He says, what's the big deal? What is the praise of the word אנוכי? This midrash promises double אנוכי in the future. What does אנוכי even mean? כתב הרמז, the רמז writes, בשם לחם עמודות על פסוק אנוכי השם לקחך. In the name of another book of the לחם עמודות. On the verse, the first verse of the Ten Commandments. I am Hashem your God. שמילת אנוכי, that the word אנוכי רומזת לשכינה בסוד נקודה פנימית. It hints to the deepest part of the supernal structure. Let's give you an introduction first. Introduction. So, God created the world with a very simple basis, template that runs through the entire universe. We call it the Ten Sefirot. Ten lights, ten emanations that come from the first flash of light from God's infinite oneness. The first flash of light was this... Uh, separation into ten lights, ten different lights. Each one has a different power, has a different uh, attribute. We call them midot, right? You heard them all the time. Chesed, din, tiferet. You hear them. Chuchma, bina. These are all different attributes, okay? And there's a very special structure of them, uh, and each one of them connects to a certain part of your body, connects to a certain part of the world, and each one of them connects to a process that's happening in the world all the time. Everything, the entire existence is dictated by how these lights interact. Because after that comes the next world, the next world, the next world. It's all reflections of those lights. Until you get to the bottom, bottom, which is the world of Asiyah, the world of action, which is our world. And basically down here, we're just seeing those lights manifest, and we also now we activate those lights. You do sins, you do Avil, you do mitzvot. And every word you speak, everything, every thought almost that you think, activates or deactivates some of these lights in the world. The top of these lights is called Keter. Keter means a crown. Which part of the body does it uh, connect to, represent? The tefillin of the Rosh, where you place that, right here, right? And uh, the little soft spot, when the baby's born, he has a little soft spot on his head over here. Scientifically, why is that? Because there's three bones. There's a parietal bone, parietal bone, they're both called parietal, right and left parietal bone, and the frontal bone of the skull. And in between the bones, there's these little collagen-like, uh, cartilage-like, like cartilage, like in your ear and your nose, soft tissue that makes it flexible. Why? In order so the baby can easily come out of the mother without getting stuck, right? The flexibility is needed. But even after it comes out, it takes about one to two years for this, it's called a suture, it's called where the three bones meet, to fully harden into bone. Until then, it's always soft. The doctor always checks it whenever he's doing checkups on the baby. And that's the exact spot where the tifilin of the head is supposed to go when he grows up. Why? That's the plug-in. Le a thousand avdalot, right? I'm not saying you should watch movies, but Many people are Belayti Shvot and they've seen this movie, so I can mention it. The Matrix. You know The Matrix. Famous movie. Remember the plug-in that he had in the back of his head? So, Lehavdil, it's almost like a plug-in over here. In the, it's only in the front of the head, okay? It's the plug-in into the upper realms. It's the kit there. It's the, the crown, the spiritual crown that goes over here. It says Adam HaRishon was created with that on his head. With the tefillin as a part of his skin. After the sin, it was separated and he had to start doing it later. Right, when they were commanded, when the Jews were commanded as tefillin, that was a new mitzvah they had to start doing. Nevertheless, let's go, so the keter means the crown. It's the first, so uh, the light of keter, what does it represent? It represents the ratzon, meaning the will of God. For anything to, create, to be created and to exist, first you need the ratzon. Which means you need a will to do it. If there's no will to make anything, nothing's going to exist. If no one thought and said, I'm going to create a microphone so that you can amplify the sound on a video, this would never exist. The first seed, the intangible thought that came into the world first was somebody said, I want to make a microphone. I want to make something to amplify sound. Boom. Then, it's, then it goes to the rest of the lights, the rest of the process. Chokhmah, Bina, Chesed, the actual building is the rest of it. Right? And that applies to anything. A human being. Abba and Ima have to say, you know what? I want to have a child. The ratzon has to come, the, the will has to be dropped in their head. I want this. Want leads to production. That's what Keter is. Okay? So, the will of God, which is the ultimate ratzon, which is what put everything into motion, was that God said the will, His will was, I want to give chesed. I want to bestow my goodness onto others. In order to do that, I have to create a universe. I have to create beings that will appreciate and understand that there's such a thing as others, so that I can give them. And that's how you created human beings, etc., etc. But that all started, the seed was in the Keter, in the, in the uh, light of Keter, in the highest world. Good. So that was the whole introduction. Now let's see what it says about that. He says over here now, the word 
Anuchi means I. There's another word in Hebrew that means I. What is it? Ani. Very common word. They're spelled the same way. The only difference between Anuchi and Ani is that Anuchi has a chaf in the middle and Ani has no chaf. What does that represent? Ani hu bechitzoniyut. ben vetet. He says like this. A lot of Kabbalistic concepts over here. We have something called the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah comes from the word Shochin. Shochin means to dwell. It means like a, uh, uh, it also means neighbor, right? Shachin. Shachin means a neighbor because he dwells next to you. It means somebody who is, when, when another being is next to you, dwelling around you. That's called Shekhinah. Our whole goal in Torah Mitzvot is to bring down God's Shekhinah. Is to have that, to feel him around us. That's what it was in Bet Midash. That's why we're crying that we don't have it. What we have now is just a remnant of it, right? How can you get it? Learning Torah, especially Halakha, the Gemara says. One guy learning Halakha, in his four months, Shekhinah can be felt. At the temple, at the, uh, the western wall, Shekhinah can be felt, etc. In Kabbalah, we have different uh, combinations of God's name that represent different parts of Him, so to speak, or different manifestations. The Shekhinah is represented by the name called Shem Ben. Ben, 52, name of 52. Why is it called name of 52? Bet Nun, 52. Because you take God's name, which is the essence name, which is the Yud and the He and the Bab and the He, and you spell out each letter. Now there's different ways to spell out each letter. And when you plug in the different ways, you get different attributes and different powers. The one we're talking about now is Shekhinah. So Yud is always spelled the same way. Take the Yud, open it up. You get Yud, Vav, Dalit. What's the matter of that? 20. 20. Right? 10 and 10. Yud is 10. Vav, 6. Dalit is 4. 10 and 10. Yud is 20. Next letter in God's name is Hey. The way we're going to spell it for this one is Hey, Hey. Two letter Hey's. You put a Tere under, it's going to be Hey. Right? 5 and 5. What's 5 and 5? 10. Good. So we have 20 and 10? 30. Next letter is Vav. How are we going to spell Vav? Simple. Vav and Vav. Double. Vav. 12. 12 and... And what do we have? 30? 42. And the last one, Hey, we're going to spell the same way. Hey and a Hey. That's 5 and 5. That's 10. 10 plus 42. 52. That's Ben. And that's the name of Ben. Okay? So that's the Shekhinah. The whole supernal structure I was trying to explain to you before, the kit there and the rest of the ninth Sefirot, the whole goal is to bring down that Shekhinah, the presence of God, in our world, because we're all the way in the bottom, in, in the Malchut, the, the tenth one. We're down there. And Shekhinah is there as well. Our goal is to bring the Shekhinah there, is to dwell with us. God wanted to create a physical world where we can purify it to the point where it will be eligible to house the Shekhinah. You understand? It depends on us. So that's what he wanted. And when he had the Mishkan, the Bet HaMikdash, for that, those windows in time, we had that. Right? But it got ruined. So we have to fix it again. Anyway. But the point is, the Shekhinah is supposed to, the Ben, the Ben, the Shekhinah, the, that name of God is supposed to come down. What does it come down through from the Keter? Keter, minus the Keter, everything else, the rest of the ten is going to be nine, right? Nine levels, nine steps. So we have the nine, plus the fifty-two. That's where we want, we want the fifty-two to travel down nine. Nine doors, so to speak. Nine plus 52 is what? 61. 61 is the same gematria of Ani. Aleph, Nun, Yud, Ani. Right? That's God, Ani. God always refers to himself as Ani. Ani Hashem Lekuchim. I am Hashem God took you out, right? Because that's the point. 61, Ani has to come down. Ani is, by the way, also one of God's names. God has many names, as you know. One of them is Ani as, as well. Where you derive that is very fascinating, but I don't have the time for that right now. So further, look where he says, Umasha, I'm not going to say that it's called Ephraim. Okay, let's skip this part. 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 So he says the difference between Ani and Anochi is that Anochi has the Chaf. Ani has no Chaf. What is the Chaf representing in the word Anochi? He says the Chaf is representing. Keter. Keter starts with the letter Chaf. That's the top one. So when you have Keter, when God is using the word Anochi, He is giving you the insight of the whole picture. Meaning, such an intimate connection. To reach the level of Keter, the level of Keter is almost impossible. The, only, the, Shla, the Shla Yuchot Abrit, a Brit, very important uh, Kabbalistic book, explains that 
Keter is not knowable to most of us. The only remnant of Keter you could access is the very bottom of Keter. And that very bottom of Keter is called Da'at, knowledge. You've heard Chabad, right? Chabad is Chokhma Bina Da'at. Because Bina Da'at are the next two, and, Chabad, and uh, Da'at is the middle one. The bottom of Keter. So that's what you could reach. And if you're on a huge, very high level, you can reach that. Beyond that is really God's inf infinity. Very hard to understand. But when God uses the Anuchi, that's a help. It's an insight to reach that level. To reach the ultimate connection with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, with God. With the Anuchi. The Ani is the whole supernal structure we explained. Ben 52 with 9. 9 means not including Keter. Keter is not included in there. So, yes, there is a connection, there is a revelation on that level, but it's not as deep as Anochi. Because Anochi has the Chaf and the Keter in there. And that's what God showed us a glimpse of at Mount Sinai, when He gave us the Torah, and He opened up the, the Torah with Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem your God. And uh, how do we know the ultimate connection? The Midrash says the people were dying and coming back to life. When they heard God's voice, the first two commandments God said, their Neshamot came out. Why? Because God said Anochi. He used the Anuchi. Their Neshamot skyrocketed to Keter. And when it goes like that, you can't stay, you can't remain in the physical world they were. They died. So God said, He, he resurrected their deaths. They're not as too early. It's not yet. He sent the, the souls back down. He resurrected them. And then God continued the second commandment. Same thing happened because it was all connected to the Keter. Uh, all connected to Anuchi. Once God uttered the first one, Anuchi, that's it. It was, it was like He gave them the keys to Da, to, to Keter, connected them. And they couldn't handle it. So that's what they said. God, uh, Mo, they said to Moshe, Moshe, you take the rest. We can't handle this. The rest is you, and you you can handle going up to Keter. We can't. You do that, and then you tell us the rest. And we, we believe you. We trust you. Right? So that was the glimpse. And then God says, "You think that was something? Wait till Mashiach comes. Wait till the end of days." Anochi, Anochi, Menachem Chem. The first uh, par, uh, pasuk of our Paftarah this week. God says, double Anuchi. I'm going to give you a double Anuchi when I console you in the future. You're going to be in Keter, in that, around me and with me. To an unbelievable spiritual ecstasy you'll never understand until that day happens. That's the depth of the Anuchi versus the Ani. Again, I summarized it, I paraphrased it, I gave, I gave some of my own insights because we're running short on time, but I think, I think it still gives you the same juice over here. Baruch Hashem. That's what he says over here. And then, I'm going to give you one more thing over here. Another way we can explain, we can explain the Midrash with the king and the queen. The queen said, you want me back? Give me double the Kitubah. What is the connection of the Anuchi to the Kitubah? Right? Because the whole point was that that Midrash connected those two ideas. So just like over here, you know, he takes it back, double Kitubah, same thing, guys, name double Anuchi. Okay. So you're comparing the Kitubah to Anuchi over here. What is it? What is the connection? This is the Kitubah is a type of gift the husband gives to his wife. A guarantee, a security, an insurance. But it's something physical, it's something she can hold. Because she has the document. She holds. The law is she and her, or her family is supposed to, uh, her mother or something like that, her parents, are supposed to have the ketubah by them. So it's a physical thing that he gives her, a physical gift. But in the word anuchi, kashe, the mamatana, he's a, where's the physicality in anuchi? What, what's the physical gift, so to speak, that God gives to Jewish people? It's not a physical thing at all. It's not a document that you can hold and say, I have the money right here. It's, it's not money, it's more beyond that. So, what's the comparison? Omnam, nevertheless, b'mashe amarnu nicha shapir. Based on what we said, we can explain it well, it says. Shimilat anuchi, because the word anuchi romezit lepenimut ha-kedusha. Anuchi hints to the deep uh, connection to God, as we explained. The deepest of the deep, and the level of da'at and keter. And furthermore, Anuchi is what uh, uh, cleans out the, the bad from the good. It, it, it refines, it's a refinement. 
It's the ultimate refinement. That's what we're looking for in the future. This also has, is connected to, to, to the gerim, to uh, converts. Because converts, when they convert, they're being refined. Those souls from the goyim are being taken out, are being refined, purified, and entering to the proper place. So it's also connected to this. It says, that is the physical gift of Anochi Anochi. That, uh, it's a, like I said, it has to do with the refinement of the good from the bad. And the physical gift that was being hinted at is the converts that you will receive. Because the converts, when they convert, it, that's a re- refinement of the good from the bad. And we see in history that we, many, many big converts progressed and pushed our religion, our Torah, our Yahadut to where it is today. Who are they, for example? It gives, it, it gives you a list right here. Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, his, who was from descendants of converts. Huge gift. Without him, we have nothing. No Torah today. Shemaya and Naftalion, these two converts, Shemaya and Naftalion, I actually have uncles, both of them. One uncle, his name is Shemaya, his other one is Naftalion. Very rare names. But they were converts who were the leaders of the entire Jewish nation at the time. Very, very early. In the beginning of Pekel Avot, it goes through the, uh, the reigns, the eras of who, who ruled the Jewish people uh, one after another. One of them was Shemaya and Naftalion. One was Avbedin, the other one was a president. They were converts, but they were huge in Torah. They had the only Shivot. And all the major Chachamiyah after that learned to their Yeshivot. Hillel is again, for, like, for example, Bet Shemayi Bet Hillel, they learned by Shemayi Naftalion. Two converts as well. And we have other ones, Rabbi Meir also, Rabbi Meir, who is, has a huge contribution to the Mishnah and the Gemara. He's all over almost on every page. He was also from converts. If you want to look more into that, we have a lecture who he came from. He came from Nero. Nero was one, a Roman general who was sent to destroy the temple, the second temple, by the Caesar. That's chapter 7 of our book, Hatzar Yosef. We have on the same channel about four or five lectures about that story of Nero, how Nero converted and eventually gave birth to Rabbi Meir. That came from him. And now in the future, Am Yisrael is going to request from God that you should double our ketubah. What does it mean? That you should do another refinement. And take out from the nations all of those holy sparks of good souls that got uh, you know, stuck by them that they need to convert. Bring all them back to us in the future. And, that's, that's, and the point is a very, very important point there. Why? Because in the future, once Moshiach comes, there's not going to be any more converts. The last group of converts, whoever they're going to be, is going to be right before Mashiach comes. Why? Because once Mashiach comes, and the whole world is going to know that Am Yisrael is true, Torah is true, and there's, you, there's no more test. There's no more converts. We're not going to accept you. Now that you know the winner of the game is, you're going to join our team? No, no, no. You have to join the team before the game is over. That's how it works. So that, exa- that is the, the gift, the double gift, that not only are we going to have the deep connection with God, we're also going to have all our converts that are going to come back to Am Yisrael and bring us up to the ultimate point like they have been doing so far. Baruch Adonai Ne'olam. Amen ve'amen.